Good afternoon, uh, all my senior faculty members, uh, all the senior doctors, and some of my dear friends. I am Dr. Bhushan Sanjay Bhagat, basically belonging to Rahuri Ahmednagar district. Uh, son of Dr. Sanjay Bhagat, uh, general practitioner, and Dr. Madhuri Bhagat, a uh, gynecologist, both from Rahuri. I am associated with Sayari Hospital since six months with an experience of seven years in surgical oncology. So today I am going to uh, give a brief idea about surgical oncology, how to go about, how to see patients of surgical oncology, to pick them up early and do specific investigations which can be done at place like Dound instead of sending each and every patient to Pune for each and every investigation. So let us go through each of these tumors or cancers one by one. This was my alpha matter, very precisely already described by uh, Dr. Kulkarni in my introduction. The, before starting, let me tell you what services are catered at Sayadi Hospital Pune regarding oncology. So we cater head neck cancer cases, breast cancer cases, GI malignancies, gynec malignancies, urological malignancies, soft tissue tumors, and retropedal malignancies. Apart from surgery, we have uh, advanced radiation machines at Adapsar and Surya Hospitals, two machines we have, both of them are at par. We have medical oncology services and pain and palliative services too. So starting with the first cancer, that is head and neck cancer, let us go through the symptoms of head and neck cancer. The most common symptom which heralds a cancer, a head and neck cancer or the tongue cancer is white patches or red patches. So these patches come before or they can be called as pre-management conditions of head and neck cancer. If we detect a patient who is a tobacco chewer or a smoker, in this uh, particular uh, situation, we can easily prevent that condition to convert into cancer by excision of this patch. So this is known as leukoplakia. Leukoplakia is defined as any white patch which cannot be pathologically defined or which cannot be rubbed off easily. So excision of this patch can prevent or can prevent conversion of this patch into cancer. The next very common symptom a patient presence is ulcer. Not every ulcer in the mouth is cancer. The most common cause of ulcer in the mouth is traumatic ulcer. Due to the fine or sharp teeth in the mouth, it causes chronic irritation over the tongue or the mucosa of the cheek and cause ulcer. But if that ulcer is not healing within 15 days of antibiotics or multivitamins, we should refer it to a higher oncology center where suspicion of cancer can be ruled out. Similarly, a non-healing ulcer over the cheek is similarly treated. The next symptom a head and neck cancer patient can come with is change in voice. So, if there is a malignancy or any pre lesion in the larynx or the glottis, what we call as, it causes hoarseness of voice. That is, the voice, to voice, it becomes dogra unta to awas. So, why it becomes that way is because that malignancy hampers the vocalis muscle movement in the glottis and that causes hoarseness of voice. Luckily, if the malignancy is specifically over the vocal cords, it comes to notice very, very early because hoarseness of voice can be easily detected. But if the malignancy is in above this or below this, that is we call supraglottis or infraglottis, malignancy is not detected so early and it comes in stage 2 or 3. But glottic malignancies, because of the symptom, can be detected in stage 1 itself. Coming to the next cancer, thyroid cancer. Maximum thyroid swellings are benign swellings. We can say even 90% of the swellings are benign. But which grow very rapidly could be a malignant swelling. Another criteria to detect a thyroid swelling which is malignant is the sonography criteria. Usually the first investigation for any neck swelling we do is a sonography of the neck. And that gives a TR score. That TR score we can see in the next slide. It is a depends on five various factors of sonography and based on that score we decide whether a FNAC or a biopsy is required or not and that only gives a diagnosis of thyroid cancer. Clinically symptoms of thyroid cancer are very similar to benign thyroid disease so we cannot easily differentiate benign and malignant thyroid disease clinically. Next cancer that we are going to talk about is breast cancer. This is the most common cancer in females in the world and India. 
Globocon 2020 has given the data that it has overtaken the lip cancer and lung cancer to become the rank one cancer, including males and females. This is so prevalent nowadays because of two things. One, the risk factors of breast cancer are very, very in, uh, in, the, in the rise. And the second, we have various modalities like mammography and biopsy, which we can detect breast cancer early and easily. And people are becoming more aware that are, these are the causes that is uh, causing breast cancer to increasingly being detected. So let us see what are the early symptoms of breast cancer. Most of you know that breast cancer can be detected by a lump. But which kind of lump could be a cancer? Not all lumps in the breast are cancer. So any lump which is hard, non-mobile, well-defined and or could include the skin or the pectoral muscle in, inside usually guide us towards cancer. So I will repeat, any lump which is growing very fast, is very hard, is not mobile easily or has retracted the skin or the nipple has been retracted inside these lumps usually tell us that they, it could be a cancer. non malignant lumps are very classically very firm, they are mobile easily, the skin is not involved, they are slow growing. So these characteristics tell us that the lump is non-cancerous. Other, other symptoms which tell us whether it's a breast cancer or not is red color nipple discharge. But which red color nipple discharge? Not all red nipple discharges are breast cancer the discharges which are from single breast. So if a patient comes with a discharge from bilateral breast, it is less likely to be cancer. If it is single breast, if it is coming from single duct, so some patients can come with multiple fluid dots over the nipple. That means multiple ducts are involved. That is not, tell, uh, does, not does not likely be cancer. When it is coming from a single duct, when it is from a single breast, it is spontaneous. By spontaneous, I mean if it does not come with pressure. If without pressure the red blood discharge is coming, it is more likely towards cancer. So these two features tell us which red color discharge could be cancer. Other non-specific symptoms are pain. Pain is not usually related to cancer in any of the cancers. Usually pain comes only when the cancer is very, very advanced due to neurological involvement. Other uh, symptoms in breast cancer are depressed skin, nipple changes or change in breast size. So these are basic symptoms to detect early breast cancer. Now how do we tell patients to clinically self-examination, so self-examine themselves? So the best way to detect early breast cancer is doing self-breast examination. So when do we tell the patients to get examined? It is once a month, usually two to three days after periods, that is on seventh or eighth day of the menstrual cycle is the best time to clinically self-examine a breast. Where do we examine? We examine the breast as well as the armpit. How do we examine? Please remember, please guide your patients to not examine using, like you can see my fingers, you do not catch the breast or you do not try to hold the lung. This is the wrong way to examine any breast. You use the palmar aspect of the three fingers and you rotate it over the breast and you uh, tell them to palpate the lungs this way. Palpating this way or gripping any lumps is the wrong way to examine any breast. You can either examine in up and down direction, in a wedge form or in circles. All the three ways are correct. You should also look for any dimpling over the skin, if there is any skin change color, if there is any nipple changes. So all these factors should be looked during clinical cell breast examination. Coming to the next cancer is esophagus or pharyngeal cancer. It is very easy or we can do an easy logic that if there is an esophageal cancer, there will be an obstruction in the esophagus and the most common symptom is not able to swallow liquids or solids. Symptoms that could be stomach cancer, bloating after eating, heartburn, lack of appetite, indigestion, and nausea. These are common symptoms which can be found in any acidity or indigestion we call. So there is no specific symptoms for stomach cancer to detect in early stage. But if stomach cancer advances, or there is a pylorus obstruction, then vomiting is the first symptom that comes to notice. And any persistent vomiting which is non-bilious. Why non-bilious? Because if there is an obstruction in the stomach, bile is secreted by gallbladder and some amount from the pancreas and it comes in the ampulla. If we look at the anatomy, this ampulla comes later on, right? that is it is distal to the pylorus. So if there is a stomach cancer, usually the vomiting is not green. 
is food material which is coming back within 15 minutes or 30 minutes of taking the food. But please remember that is gives a late sign of stomach cancer. There are no signs to detect stomach cancer in early stage. Coming to the next cancer, what are the symptoms that could be liver cancer? These are also very non-specific. Hepatitis or obstructive jaundice due to stones can also cause the symptoms. So the symptoms are jaundice, right-sided abdominal pain, any right-sided abdominal mass or in advanced cases, any pleural effusion could cause shortness of breath. So these all symptoms can also be seen in hepatitis. So these are very non-specific. Let us go to the next cancer that is pancreatic or gallbladder cancer. Again, these cancers cannot be detected very easily in early stage. The symptoms which come are in later stage that is jaundice and weight loss. Please remember weight loss is the very important symptom for pancreatic cancer because pancreatic cancer they secrete some kind of interleukins or interferons which cause severe cachexia that is severe weight loss and it could be a first sign of pancreatic cancer. Jaundice usually comes late only after ampulla gets obstructed. The another symptom is diabetes. Why is diabetes related to pancreatic cancer? Why could diabetes be a symptom of pancreatic cancer? It is not that all diabetic patients should be screened for pancreatic cancer, but some patients could be that diabetes is the first symptom of pancreatic cancer. Why? Because whenever there is pancreatic cancer, there could be an obstruction of the pancreatic duct. Need not that there is also an obstruction of bile duct at the same time. So usually whenever there is a bile duct obstruction, patient have jaundice and pancreatic obstruction you do not present with jaundice. So need not be that patient has jaundice, but if pancreatic duct is obstructed, it could lead to pancreatic failure. And pancreatic failure means exocrine and endocrine failure both. And hence diabetes mellitus could be a first symptom of pancreatic cancer in some cases. Coming to the next very common cancer, this is the fourth most common cancer in males worldwide and India, that is colon cancer. And this is on the rise because lot of pesticides and fertilizers that we are eating every day, even today what we ate might have been from the plants that have grown in the fertilizers. We cannot wash fertilizers away. That is a myth that fertilizers can be washed in the basin before cooking. No, they are from inside. So what we are eating today could be a cause of boom of colon cancer within a 10 years or 15 years. So what are the symptoms of colon cancer? Most common symptom is change in bowel habits. So persistent constipation could be a first symptom of colon cancer. Bloody stools, very important. Patients with bloody stools come to a primary physician first. We, we do a PR. We see hemorrhoids. We treat hemorrhoids. But so, sometimes proctoscopy is not done. We just do a PR or we see from outside. We just see hemorrhoids and we treat it. Sometimes in 10% of cases, hemorrhoids might be associated with rectal cancer also which is the cause of bleeding in that patient and we are treating the hemorrhoids which are not actually bleeding. So please do a proctoscopy along with a PR examination while treating for hemorrhoids. Other symptoms for colon cancer are pain or cramp in the abdomen that could be due to obstruction that is a late feature of colon cancer. Unintended weight loss is also a late feature in colon cancer. Rectal cancer has similar symptoms like rectal bleeding, change in bowel habits, a very specific symptom for rectal cancer is the third one that is rectal pressure or fullness. What do we mean by that? So patient very specifically says that I have just gone to the lab tree, I passed my stools but again I feel something immediately and I feel like going to the stools in, uh, to the lab tree immediately. Run. I have to run. So morning time spurious diarrhea that is called as morning time spurious diarrhea. So patient goes to the lab tree, passes that tree, comes back again he feels that some amount of that tree if he wants to pass. That is a very specific symptom of rectal cancer. Now coming to the very, the most common cancer in males, that is lung cancer due to smoking. This is now also being seen in females. Squamous cell carcinoma is the most common histology. The symptoms all of you know are cough, which is persistent, shortness of breath, that is breathlessness, or there could be hemoptysis, that is blood and cough. All these symptoms could be a cause of lung cancer. There is a screening test for lung cancer that is a low dose CT scan. A simple x-ray at place like down can also be done. So you can advise any chronic smoker to get a chest x-ray once a year at least. If he is affording or willing to go to a CT scan, it is 
also available at town. So you can get a low dose CT scan done for that patient once in a year. That is a recommended test by the government and in the guidelines it is also very well documented. The next cancers which we are going to talk about are gynecological malignancies. These are these three malignancies, uterine, ovarian and cervical cancers are the next three cancers in females after breast cancer to be the common cancers worldwide and in India. So what are the symptoms of these three cancers? You will be surprised to know that ovarian cancers does not present with direct symptoms. Why? Because when ovarian cancer or any ovarian tumor grows in size, only then it causes compression over the intestines or stomach and only then present patient comes to the doctor saying that I have indigestion, I have gas, I am not able to eat food. That is usually the first symptom in 70 to 80 percent patients of ovarian cancers. Patient does not usually present with bleeding per vagina or it does not present with pelvic pain but she presents with a fullness in stomach or loss of appetite. So that is the first or the most common symptom for ovarian cancer. The next cancer we are going to talk about is cervical cancer. Cervical cancer, the most common symptom is post-coital vaginal bleeding. This cancer has a vaccine, all of you are aware of. I would urge all of you to tell patients that there are three types of vaccines available in the market. Cervarix, Gardasil and Gardasil 9. Respectively, they, are, uh, they work against HPV variants 2, 4 and 9 respectively. This vaccine has to be given to every female between 9 to 12 years. You will be surprised to know it has been included by government of India. There might be some pediatricians in the audience. There is a immunization schedule. They have included it in the pediatric immunization schedule also. Unfortunately, those females who have not taken that vaccine because it was not there in the schedule before, can take that vaccine up to 26 years of age. The best age is 9 to 12, but also you can take up to 26. That is before, at least before marriage. Because cervical cancer occurs due to HPV virus. That virus comes into our body through un, unprotected sexual practices. So before going for any sexual practices, we should advise patients to take that vaccine. If not taken in that age group also, females who are less than 45 age should take this vaccine, get this vaccine immediately because there is some amount of benefit up to 45 years of age. There is no benefit after 45 years of age. So coming back to the symptoms, the most common symptom is post-coital vaginal bleeding. Other symptoms are pain or irregular vaginal bleeding also. There is endometrial cancer. The most common symptom or of endometrial cancer is spotting or vaginal bleeding in between menses. This is a very common symptom of endometrial cancer. Any female who is postmenopausal, who is still bleeding after a gap, is called as postmenopausal bleeding, and that is the first and foremost symptom of endometrial cancer. The next cancer is kidney cancer. Unfortunately, there are no specific symptoms for kidney cancer. Kidney cancer usually is detected when we do some tests like ULG or CT scan for some other reasons. Like a patient comes for abdominal pain, which is, could be gastritis, which could be cholecystitis. We get a ULG done and we see some kind of renal cyst, complex cyst or a renal tumor. Unfortunately, that is the only sign which says uh, usually 90% of the kidney cancer are picked up that way. So there is no specific symptom like loin pain or hematuria. They are very, very rare symptoms of kidney cancer. Prostate cancer, the symptoms of prostate cancer in males are very very similar to benign prostatic hypertrophy which we very commonly see in almost 70-80% of people who have crossed 70. We see that patients come with urinary symptoms. We do a UIG, we see that prostate is enlarged, we get a PSA done and then we come to know that PSA is in hundreds or thousands and then we get a biopsy done. That is how usually prostate cancers are detected. So either PSA or biopsy are the ways to detect prostate cancer. There are no specific symptoms. Again, penile cancer, the only and foremost symptom for penile cancer is an ulcer. Similar to cervical cancer, 80% of penile cancers are also due to HPV. 
there, this HPV vaccine is now also recommended for males also. Please, uh, if you are not aware of this, HPV vaccine can be given to males. You can advise your male patients to get it to prevent from penile cancer. Soft tissue tumor, the most common symptom is lump, lump and lump. There is no other symptom for soft tissue tumor. This was all about symptoms. Now the second part of my presentation, we would like to go through some basic tests which you can get in the year itself and which you should do correctly so that we don't have to repeat the test at our center when you refer the patient for higher treatment or uh, for further treatment. So for head neck cancer, please remember the three tests which can be done at your center are the contrast CT skull based to thorax. So please, when you are doing a CT scan for a head neck malignancy, when you see an ulcer, not only get a CT scan for oral cavity, get that CT from skull base up to the thorax. Because the most common uh, patients who come to us do not usually come in an early stage. They come very, very late and usually half of them are spread to the lung. The most common site of metastasis from head neck is to the lungs. So get a CT from skull base to thorax whenever you are getting a CT for the oral malignancy. A punch biopsy can be done and a fiber optic laryngoscopy, if possible, you can get it done here. And these three are investigations which we require for diagnosis and further management. For thyroid cancer, all of you know that a sonography neck has to be done. Please remember for thyroid, do not uh, go or urge the patient or ask the radiologist to do a biopsy. For thyroid, FNSE is recommended and required. Thyroid is a very uh, vascular organ, so biopsy is not at all recommended in thyroid. FNAC is enough for diagnosis and for the management. We will not uh, ask the patient, if the patient has done FNAC at your center and you are referring it for further management at our center, we will not ask him to get a biopsy in thyroid. So FNAC is enough. For breast cancer, it is very, very important to know that a biopsy, obviously, I will uh, tell in detail, first let me go through a radiological investigation which you need to do here is that if a female is less than 35 years of age and presents with a lung which you think with the clinical features I described, you think that is a, towards malignancy, you get a UIG done. Why? And if the female is more than 35, you get a mammography. There is a reason. So if you understand the logic behind it, you will not forget. You can see the mammogram beneath. It's a simple x-ray. So the, both the mammograms are normal mammograms. You might think that the mammogram which contains a lot of white patches could be a malignancy or something. No, it's a mammography of a female who is less than 35 years of age. A female less than 35 comes in a reproductive age group. Her breast contains more lobules compared to fat because she might get pregnant. That way the body has been made. So because the more lobules are there, mammography looks like this. And if there is a malignancy behind this, you cannot easily detect on mammography because already those lobules are white. Hence, a sonography is recommended for a female less than 35 years of age. But if a female has crossed 35, usually the breasts are like in the second image. The breast is clear because it is more fatty rather than globular. Hence, mammography is indicated for female who is more than 35 because any lump can easily be detected on such a T mammography. And the sonography should be done for less than 35. Now coming to FNSE versus biopsy. In the last slide, I have told you that FNAC is only the investigation required for thyroid. But in breast, the case is reversed. In breast, if you get a FNAC done, you send it to a higher center for surgery, we will have to get a biopsy also again. So patient has to get two tests unnecessarily. So while sending any patient of a breast lung, which you think could be cancer, please directly do a biopsy and send. Or uh, you can at least tell the radiologist to get a biopsy done rather than a FNC. Why? So if you th uh, get the logic, you will remember because we need some tissue blocks to get ERPR and HER2 reports that is immunohistochemistry because nowadays we have advanced forms of chemotherapy available for breast cancer and that can be done only on tissue blocks and not on FNC. The next cancer is esophagus or stomach cancer. The investigations required for us to detect or treat are upper GI endoscopy, endoscopy guided biopsy, and the CT of the thorax and abdomen both. For esophagus, this is required because malignancies of esophagus usually come down to the celiac nodes or the lymph nodes in the abdomen. And stomach cancer could spread to the thorax. Hence, we usually recommended both these malignancies. 
chest and abdominal CT both have to be done in the same setting. Unnecessary patient does not have to go for two times for CT scan. Liver cancer, triple phase contrast. This is very important. If you suspect there is something in the liver on a sonography and you think that some investigation further has to be done, do not go for a routine CCT. Specify in the form for the radiologist that a triple phase CT scan has to be done. So a triple phase CT scan gives a better idea about liver malignancies and pancreatic cancers also. Other than that, routine liver function test and a specific tumor marker, alpha ketoprotein, can be done when you suspect a liver cancer. For pancreatic cancer, again a triple phase CT scan, these two organs, we need a triple phase CT scan to delineate each and every a mass in them. Other tests that have to be done is liver function test. Specific tumor markers are CA99 and less specific is CEA and the upper GI endoscopy. So if you do a battery, this battery of test at your center and then you refer, we would be very happy because most of our work is already done by you. Next cancer is colon or rectum cancer. A contrast CT scan of thorax, abdomen and pelvis to look for meds also. Colonoscopy, a colonoscopic biopsy and a tumor marker called CEA is quite specific, not very specific but quite specific for intestinal malignancies. So this battery of tests could be done for colon cancer or rectal cancer. For lung cancer, a contrast CT of chest. Please remember if on X-ray you think that a lung cancer is central, that is in midline, you should go for a bronchoscopy guided biopsy. If the lesion is in the periphery, you can ask your radiologist to go for a ULG guided or a CT guided biopsy. This is very important. Unnecessarily for a central lesion which is near the bronchus, you need not go from the side of the periphery of the chest to reach in the center. And the reverse way, if the lesion is on the periphery, you do not go through bronchoscopy to get a biopsy. So wherever the lesion is, we use those specific tests to get the biopsy. Now coming to the gynec malignancies, which test should be done is a contrast CT. Please remember this is very important. For all pelvic malignancies, I advise MRI of the pelvis, except ovarian cancer. For ovarian cancer, CT abdominal pelvis is the investigation of choice. For other cancers like uterus cancer, vaginal cancer, cervix cancer, rectal cancer, urinary bladder cancer. So all organs in the pelvis require an MRI except ovary where we require a CT scan. Other than that, CA125 is the specific tumor marker which is usually in thousands and we come to know whether it's a malignancy using this marker. For endometrial cancer, I repeat MRI of the abdomen pelvis. Other than that, endometrial biopsy, either you can do a DNC, a lot of gynecologists might be there in the audience. So a dilatation and curettage is also sufficient. If you have a hysteroscope, very, very good, you can do a hysteroscopic biopsy also. But a DNC is also sufficient for getting a chunk or a specific uh, biopsy of endometrium. For cervical cancer, again I repeat, MRI of the abdomen and pelvis and the cervix sponge biopsy. Please remember, pap smear is not a diagnostic test for cervical cancer. It just tells us whether atypical cells, that is pre-cancerous cells are there or not. It does not tell whether cancer is there or not. That is kidney cancers, contrast city of thorax, abdomen and pelvis should be done. For prostate cancer, MRI, abdomen and pelvis, again I repeat, it is a pelvic organ. Other than that, the PSA, usually PSA, when a patient comes to us for a benign prostatic hypertrophy, PSA is between uh, 0 to 10. Sometimes below 4 is the best. You advise the patient to go home, take tamsulosin or any specific tablet urology has recommended. 4 to 10 is borderline. And when it is in hundreds, then we think of prostate cancer. Other than that, TRUS guided biopsy can be done to detect prostate cancer. TRUS, the full form of TRUS is transrectal ultrasonography. Transrectal ultrasonography guided biopsy is the uh, biopsy required for prostate cancer. The second image shows the truss image. For penile cancer, biopsy and the MRI pelvis with bilateral upper thigh. Why bilateral upper thigh? Because penile cancer very commonly spread to the environment nodes. And to detect those nodes, sometimes in fatty, fatty males, usually environment region is very fatty and UAG is not sufficient. So why do you have MRI? When we detect a penile cancer, get an MRI of penis, penis and bilateral upper thighs also. Soft tissue tumors, 
Some places a CT scan can be done, like if the soft tissue tumor is in the abdomen, then a CT scan is recommended. But if the soft tissue tumor is in the periphery, like thighs or arms, then an MRI is recommended. Other than that, please, it is very very important to note as a primary physician when we go for a biopsy of soft tissue tumor, do not go far away. Suppose the tumor is in the uh, arm on the anterior aspect, do not insert the biopsy needle from the lateral side. Because by, when we go for surgery later on, we have to remove that biopsy point also, specifically in soft tissue tumors. So when you go for a biopsy in soft tissue tumors, use the point on the skin which is closest to the tumor by doing the biopsy in soft tissue tumors specifically. Coming to my last slide, just to remind you, in thyroid, do not do a biopsy, only FNSC, but also please remember, do not do any kind of FNSC or biopsy when you suspect kidney cancers, ovarian cancers, liver cancer and pancreatic cancer. This is very, very important because if you FNA or biopsy these regions, the stage jumps from stage 1 to stage 3. This is very important. Do not undergo any invasive test if you suspect a kidney cancer, ovarian cancer, liver cancer or a pancreas cancer. This was all about my presentation. Thank you so much for your time. This is my visiting card. You can note down my contact number from this. If you have any doubts or any patients, you can definitely refer or ask me on the phone also. Thank you.